40. Okay, so I know that we've mentioned all of this before, but it's really important. So I want to reiterate to make sure that you all remember that it's really important. Okay, what we're going to talk about, or what we have been kind of talking about so far today, is something called cardiorespiratory fitness. Okay, cardiorespiratory fitness. It's sometimes called aerobic fitness or endurance fitness or whatever, aerobic capacity. But what it really is, is it's going to encompass the ability of the cardiovascular system and the pulmonary system, as well as kind of the, the mitochondria and things in your muscles to use oxygen to make energy to allow us to do longer time frame exercise. Okay. Of all of the things that we have, and I'll show you guys this in the next slide. This has a very, very strong relationship with mortality risk, probably more so than grip strength or squat strength or something else. Cardiorespiratory fitness is maybe the best physiological predictor of mortality risk because it encompasses so many things. Okay? The other really important thing here comes from a concept that has used to be called sort of uh, the idea of something that would be called fat but fit or obese but fit. But what we know is that higher levels of cardiorespiratory fitness can offset much of the excessive mortality that is associated with being overweight and obese in adults. Okay, This is the idea that you can be overweight or obese but very active and therefore have a good or a properly functioning cardiorespiratory system, and that will counteract much of the increase in mortality from the excess fatness that's associated with obesity. Okay, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of that later on. Okay, and then what we also know is that within a particular body mass index group, so within people that are either normal weight or overweight or obese, that people that have a higher cardiorespiratory fitness will have a lower relative risk than their, their more unfit peers. And so while in general, being more active and more fit can subsume the deleterious effects of obesity, even if you're not obese, okay, and you're gonna be better off than a person that might be obese, but even among people that are normal weight, people that have higher cardiorespiratory fitness levels are still gonna have better health outcomes, okay? Are still gonna have better health outcomes. And so this, for that reason, this is one of the strongest predictors of mortality and quality of life. Okay. So I've shown you guys this before, but this very clearly demonstrates what we call the dose response between this idea of physical fitness on this graph. This physical fitness is cardiorespiratory fitness. This is measured as VO2 max, so the maximal volume of oxygen take up in your lungs, move from the cardiovascular system out to your muscles and use in those long times. And this is just the percentile. So these are the most fit people that they tested. These are the least fit people that they tested at zero. You can break people in these percentages. And you'll just note that there's a much larger reduction in relative risk of all-cause mortality if we look at how fit you are based upon your VO2 max in comparison to just who is more active, okay? And this is where the distinction between physical activity and exercise becomes very key. It's good to be active. It's good to be active, okay? It's good to walk around a bunch. It's, not, it's better to not sit on your butt all day, yay for desk jobs and those. It's good to be active. It's even better if that activity involves exercise with the express purpose of increasing your VO2 max or increasing your, your cardiorespiratory fitness. Okay? And so by the end of the week, we will know what should I do to try to get myself into this kind of upper 50 or upper 25% of fitness levels. All right. So put all of these things up here for you guys, okay? 
So why do we want to test this? So the next piece of the lecture is we've decided, hopefully I've convinced you guys that knowing your cardiorespiratory fitness is a good and important thing. We're going to talk then about why and how do we want to test it. So one of the really cool things about knowing this is it tells us how fit you are right now. And that gives us a jumping off point to see if you change your activity or your exercise levels, are we going to get concomitant changes in your fitness? Are you doing something? Is it actually working? Okay. Is it working? I signed up for Peloton, which on all the commercials, they allege this is going to really work. And you, you know, all of these things. I bought my $1,500 bike and I'm paying my 60 bucks a month to be on the Peloton sort of thing. And I'm doing this. Is it actually working? Am I getting more fit? And then is that going to be a good thing? Okay. We can also, as part of our test, okay, for some of the ways that we test cardiorespiratory fitness, it will let us look at and track the physiological responses during that test. We can track how your cardiovascular system works. We can track how your pulmonary system works. Okay. And we can use that as a way to diagnostically figure out, is there a pathology in those places? Okay. Is your heart rate changing the way that it should? Is your stroke volume changing the way that it should? Is your blood pressure changing the way that it should? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And so understanding these kinds of things, can help us screen for coronary artery disease risk, can help us screen for different pulmonary pathologies uh, and the like, okay? It also can provide a basis for our exercise program. If we know how fit you are now, we can use that fitness level and the work rates that evoke certain sort of percentages of that maximal fitness to program, right? If I know that your VO2 max is 40 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute, I can just like we did with resistance training, I can say, if I want to get better, I need to go run today and I need to be at 75% of that value. So we'll talk about how you're like, well, Dr. Black, how am I going to know what my oxygen consumption is at any given point in time? I'm going to be a little embarrassed if I got to wear around a metabolic cart in a fanny pack with a you know, face mask on to collect all of my, the air that I'm breathing around when I'm going to go to, go to class today. We'll talk about how we can do this in, in kind of a reasonable manner. Okay. So, and then it can let us, once you guys know what's going on, I think it can have some other programmatic things for us. Okay. All right. So I feel like we've talked about this a little bit before. But I'm going to reiterate some more of it because it's really important. It's kind of the key thing in the midst of all of this. Okay. Cardiorespiratory fitness is called or known as VO2 max or VO2. Okay. And this is just an integrative physiological measure that's going to tell us the maximal capacity to bring oxygen in from atmospheric air through the lungs, diffuse it onto hemoglobin pulmonary capillaries, have that those red blood cells go back to the heart, get ejected through my cardiac output out to muscle tissue, diffuse the oxygen in from the capillaries into the, the muscle cells or into the muscle fibers, and then use that oxygen in those muscles mitochondria to make ATP. Okay? So it involves multiple systems, but it's essentially our ability to use oxygen to make energy for exercise. And it encompasses all of these different things, which is why it's such a good predictor of mortality. If you have a pathology or a problem anywhere in the cardiovascular, pulmonary, circulatory, right, or even in skeletal muscle, you've got a pathology somewhere, it's going gonna, it's gonna to show up in our measurement. This is more advanced physiology, and we're not going to go into the details of all of this. Okay. Much to the chagrin of Dr. Kellawan, who is our cardiovascular physiologist. But in essence, there are really two sides or kind of two physiological sides to what determines your VO2 max. Okay. We've talked about both of these variables before. 
And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna introduce it ever so slightly. That's all that I want you to know. Okay. The things that determine your your VO2 max are maximal cardiac output. Okay, maximal cardiac output. We're gonna make the assumption in regular people that the pulmonary system functions properly, which in most people it does. So if that's the case, then max cardiac output is gonna tell us kind of the most your cardiovascular system can do. Okay, so max heart rate multiplied by max stroke volume, and then maximal arterial venous oxygen difference, which is the most oxygen that can be taken up out of those capillaries and brought into the muscle and nerves. Okay, so basically, how much oxygen can I deliver to the muscles versus how much can I diffuse in and use? Right. I assure you, it's way more complicated than that. There's all sorts of mathematical equations to try to model this, but this is a very general overview. Okay, so. This lets us make use of something called the Fick equation that I do want you guys to know. I do want you to know the Fick equation. The Fick equation tells us, and this works at rest, during walking, jogging, or during a maximal effort to determine VO2 max, is that at any instant in time, okay, your energy expenditure via oxygen, VO2, is equal to your heart rate at that moment, multiplied by your stroke volume, multiplied by your AVO2 difference. So your cardiac output, how much blood is moving around, multiplied by how much oxygen is being taken out of the blood, tells us what you are doing at that exact moment. Okay? The Fick equation is really useful. The Fick equation can explain to you guys why would we expect other things being equal my VO2 max to be lower than all of you in class. Well, max VO2 is max heart rate multiplied by max stroke volume multiplied by maximal AVO2 difference. My max heart rate is 20 beats per minute lower than most of y'all. So I'm screwed from that standpoint, right? I cannot make my cardiac output as large as most of you guys can because of my heart rate, okay? So we might predict then that that's a consequence of aging and why older people have tend to have somewhat lower VO2 maxes than younger people, everything else being equal. Everything else is never equal. But if it was, that's going to be that thing. You guys all talked about the back of black, whoever has the largest stroke volume is going to have the largest VO2 max. Let's just measure their left ventricle size. Well, all of y'all are the same age. Your max heart rate's about the same. Let's measure left ventricle size, which determines stroke volume. That's a pretty good way to estimate then what max VO2 is going to be. Boom, done, great. Okay, it's fine. I would do all of that. Okay, this one, the ABO2 different would be great if we could measure it, but it's really, really, really freaking hard. Okay. So that's what the fake equation can tell us. If two people are equal on these things, if their ABO2 difference is, is different, then we can probably assume that they've got something going on either in their capillaries or in their mitochondria that's going to let that be the case. How would you measure that? How would we measure ABO2 difference? Uh, I have to have an arterial and a venous catheter going on either side of the muscle that we're using during exercise. So I know how much oxygen is going in, I don't know how much is, is left when it comes out, which we can do, but. Right? Why do you want me to run an arterial catheter on you? We can do it. I'm not going to do it. We can get us a we can get a cardiac nurse to do it. So that's kind of the usefulness of all of that. Okay. All right. So I think we've talked about this before, but I don't remember for sure. Here are the rough values. Okay. Here are the rough values. So in kind of average college age women and average college age men. You guys, ladies, y'all will have a value, um, an average person that is somewhere between maybe 30 and 40 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute. Okay. We normalize oxygen consumption to body size. Okay. We normalize the body size. If we don't do that, then all bets are off. Okay. So 30 to 40 
Guys are 35 to 45. This is all primarily driven by the fact that men tend to have a lower percent body fat and a higher percentage of muscle mass than women do. Okay. So if you find men and women that are roughly equal on their percent fat and their percent muscle and their body weight, then their values are very often going to be relatively similar. Okay. In elite female distance athletes, they're going to have values that are maybe, you know, one and a half to two times what the average are. So maybe 60 to 75 mLs per kg per minute. Elite male athletes are going to be maybe 75 to 85 in that particular range. Okay. If you have a person that has just had a heart attack, they're at maybe 20, right? So they're like half of what average. And then the really, really bad ones are people that have some kind of pulmonary disorder. They've got really bad COPD or emphysema. They may be at like 13 to 15 mLs per patient. Okay. For most of you guys, if we just had you go out and we're going to go walk across campus to the union, your VO2 during that walking bout is probably going to be in the mid to high teens in mLs per patient. So you can imagine a scenario whereby just walking briskly is practically impossible for people that have some kind of pulmonary pathology. And it's really difficult for people that are kind of immediately post heart attack. Okay? So we take a lot of this for granted. But because when the cardiovascular system doesn't work right and your cardiac output goes way down or your pulmonary system doesn't work right. And so Dan's idea that we cannot saturate hemoglobin correctly, right? That's going to happen. Then you can really reduce your max. And so normal activities are basically going to require a maximal effort out of these people. And that becomes really important. Um, so the highest ever VO2 values in female athletes, I feel like the highest I've ever seen in a woman is about 77 or 78 mLs per kg per minute. In dudes, it's like 97. Um, and so I think I told you guys at some point a few years ago, we tested um, some of the women and the men on the OU's cross country and distance, the distance runners on the track team. And these were the people that couldn't even make it to the conference meet in outdoor track. And the guys had an average VO2 of about 77 mLs per kg per minute, and the women were at about 65 or thereabouts. And so I just want you all to understand that when we look at these things, that you can have a really, really high VO2 max, and it may not necessarily be 100% indicative in people that are similar of who's going to win a race. Okay. If you are really, really fit, you're way better than an average person. You're going to smoke them in a race, but somebody might be at 65 and somebody else might be at 70 and the person at 65 can beat them in a race every time because of some other things. You just kind of have to be in the ballpark. Dr. Mike will talk to you guys more about kind of how we sort some of that stuff out. Um, there's some other things that, that kind of fit into the ballpark. Okay. okay, so let's talk very, very briefly about are there some things that influence what your VO2 max is? Okay. So the big thing is your training status, which I have listed as number three here. I should probably have this as number one. Okay. And then if we want, we can let Dr. Vellers talk about the genetics of all of this. Um, well, she can check me on this. If she'd like to come up and do a half hour on the genetics of, and trainability of VO2 max, she can, because that is her, her true area of study and expertise. But Generally, how well trained you are is going to be one of the big things that has an influence on this. Okay. If you run all the time and somebody else never runs, you're probably going to be in a pretty good place to have a higher VO2 max. Okay. Genetics is probably number two. The Herod study tells us, am I right, Dr. Bellers, 25 to 40%. They've done stuff in familial linkages. They've done stuff in identical twins and stuff and maybe 25 to 40%, okay? A quarter to almost a half of what your VO2 max is is due to your genetics, okay? Again, in some ways, thank your mom. If you're really fit and you're good at this, 
thank your mom. She gave you good mitochondria. Okay. But that's going to be there. So there are some people that no matter what they do, their VO2 max is just not going to be that high. There are other people that even if they do nothing, you can have a pretty high VO2 max. Okay. We're going to, we'll do test type last. Sex matters in general. Men tend to be a little higher than women. A lot of that is driven by, it's driven by percent body fat. Okay. Ladies, I'm sorry. Y'all are going to look at it this way. You're punished by childbirth. Your bodies are designed to be able to carry a child to term. Therefore, you need or it wants you to have larger adipose tissue stores in order to have a larger energy reserve so that you can, you can support uh, you can support a fetus. Okay? So we can make the men look just like women by making them wear a backpack and putting weights in the backpack. So they, they've done some studies with all of this. Where you take guys and you make them run with a weighted vest on or a weighted backpack, and we, we sort of normalize from all of that out. You make them look from a body composition standpoint just like a similar woman, and their values are basically the same. Okay, so that's going to matter. We talked about age. Young people tend to be larger than old people because of our decline in uh, max heart rate, but there are also some other things. Max stroke volume tends to fall with age. Uh, there can be some differences in blood volume, mitochondrial function may tend to fall with age and, and some other things. But in general, young people are going to have larger values than old. Okay. To that end, train now. It's much easier to have a high VO2 max now than it is when you get older. If you train now, you have you've got a bigger range to fall through. When the inevitable decline comes for you, because it's coming. Wait, it's coming. Okay. And so that would be sort of my, my, my approach there. The last thing which gets into kind of how we're going to do our assessments is the testing type. Okay. Again, Dr. Mike will talk about this in a lot, a lot, a lot of detail, but to truly have and to truly know what your VO2 max is, we need to have you do an exercise where you use both your lower body and your upper body in these kind of rhythmic contractions. So you need to run, okay? Or you need to cross country ski, or probably you need to elliptical where you're actually using your arms. That's gonna give us the largest value, okay? When we cycle, we tend to get maybe a value, unless you're an elite cyclist, it's maybe 90 to 95% of what we get run. Because when you bike, you're not using your arms nearly as much as when you run. And energy expenditure and therefore oxygen use is related to actively contracting muscle. There's a little less in cycling. A lot of our estimation protocols are for cycling. Cycling is easy. Cycling is weight supported. And if you've got people that have bad balance or something, you can put them on the bike and it's a lot safer. Although they make harnesses and things, if you guys have ever seen those, that keep you on the treadmill, they put you in a harness. And so if you lose your balance and you trip or something, the harness sort of holds you up and keeps you from falling. Not that big of an issue in you guys, okay? However, maybe clumsy you think you might be, an older individual that has real balance problems is going to be one of those. And then people will do arm cramp cycling. So you just ride the bike with your arm. You're just going a little bit like this, okay? And you get a value that's maybe two thirds to three quarters of what your running max is. We did a study a few years back in, uh, in my lab where we had people, we, we compared their arm crank cycling values to their regular leg cycling values. And you do the arm crank test and you get to where you couldn't turn the bike anymore and you're not even out of breath. You're just like, I cannot go any farther. I'm totally wiped out. And you're just like, I'm barely breathing very hard at all because the values are so low. You have this much higher capacity to be able to keep going because it's just such a small amount of muscle mass. You can, you don't have to tax your pulmonary system or your cardiovascular system, but that muscle is, is really, really maxed out. Okay. So I say all of this to tell you guys that if you have athletes or people that are rehabbing or something else that need to use a particular modality of exercise, for whatever reason, then you can modify your test and assess the best they can do on that specific test. 
Okay, it's easy in you guys. We put you on the bike and we have you run and we figure it out. But you might have people that have had a stroke and they can't use one side of their body. So you're gonna need, you're gonna want them to arm crank, or you're gonna want them to try to ride, a, you know, to ride a bike in a particular way, or they don't have very good balance, or they're in a wheelchair, or whatever. You can modify these things and assess in a very specific manner. Okay, okay. let's take our five minute break. That seemed to be a universally loved thing in the assessment. So we'll take our five minute break. Everybody can get up, do some jumping jacks, okay? And we'll come back at 11.35. Let's talk about the different, different ways that we can potentially test your cardio respiratory fitness. Okay. So you guys got at this a little bit in your answers, but the best way would be to do something called a maximal test, okay, or a VO2 max test. And what makes something a maximal test is regardless of what we're doing, if it's running, if it's biking, if it's the step test, whatever it is, you're going to go all the way until your heart rate maxes out and you basically cannot go anymore. We put you on a treadmill, we have you go at a certain speed, and we just keep progressively increasing the slope on the treadmill until that's it. So you cannot go anymore. And okay? that's a maximal test. That's the best way to do it. We couple that with something called open circuit spirometry or indirect calorimetry, where we collect the gases that you're breathing out. And we can try to get a direct measure uh, or a direct assessment of your oxygen levels. Okay. Terminology wise, if it's done running or walking on a treadmill, that's called a max test. If it's done cycling or something like that, we call it a peak test. Some people make a really big fuss over all of this. I just want to introduce the terms to you guys. Okay. So this is expensive. This is hard to do. Okay. Your participant has to be super motivated. You need specialized equipment. You need the metabolic card to do all of this. So what most oftentimes happens in non-laboratory settings is something that we call a submaximal test. Okay, a submaximal test. When you do a submaximal test, what we're going to do is you're going to do something and never get to max, but based upon sort of how much work you're able to do at a certain percentage of your max heart rate we can use that to then estimate forward what your max would be. So there are submaximal tests on a treadmill. There are submaximal tests on the bike. There are submaximal tests where you run, where you walk. There are submaximal tests where you do the step test on the bench, okay? While the modality may differ, the idea behind them is the same, okay? Is that we're going to estimate based upon a heart rate at some submaximal work rate. We know that when you're walking at five miles an hour, or that's probably a job for most people, if you're walking at four miles an hour and your heart rate is something, and then you go to jogging at six miles an hour and your heart rate goes up to something else, and then you jog at seven miles an hour and it goes up again, we can estimate because of the relationship of heart rate to oxygen consumption. We can estimate out what we think the running speed or the cycling resistance would need to be to get you to your age predicted max heart rate. And from that work rate, we can estimate what your VO2 max is. Okay. On the treadmill, the most common protocols that are used is something called the Bruce test. Okay. If you guys ever go to the hospital, and you watch people do a 
quote unquote stress test. So they put the EKG on someone and they're going to track how their sort of how their EKG is doing to see if they've either had a heart attack or at risk for a heart attack. They're most likely going to do the Bruce protocol. The Bruce protocol, you start off walking at like 1.7 miles an hour at like an 8% incline. And every three minutes, the speed goes up and the incline goes up. And you just keep going until you get to say 80% of your age predicted max heart rate. And at that, you figure out what your incline is and your walking speed or jogging speed is at that particular heart rate. And then you can plug that into an equation and it will estimate what your risk is. The bulky test does the same thing, but it, it really only increases, you pick a speed and it only increases the incline. And then on the bike, you guys will do these in some of the other lab classes if you take them. We're not going to do it at hours because of COVID, but we've done something called the YMCA bike test. And you get on a bike and you get your resting heart rate. And you ride at a very light resistance for three minutes and measure your heart rate. And based upon what it is, then we increase the resistance for like 10 minutes afterwards. And we track what happens with your heart rate. And then you have to plot it on a graph and, and do some fun things there. And you can estimate what your risk is. Okay. The Astrian Riving Test is the, basically the same thing. There's just a slightly different manner of, of estimating, but it's the same idea. You go at these submaximal work rates, we measure your heart rate, and we use that then to estimate. Okay. These are the ways that we can do. What we're going to do is something called the six minute walk. Okay, and so I didn't do this here. Okay, the six minute walk test, and I apologize for the craziness of this graph, but what you're seeing here is each dot represents one person. And it was their peak VO2. So this is measured on the bike. And these are in older individuals. You'll note that some of them have these very, very low values, like their VO2 max is like seven, okay? I could, you know, we could ask McKenna to stand up and do two jumping jacks and her VO2 is at seven. Okay, not that big of a deal to us, but and then their high ones are like in the 30s. So these are mostly older adults. But what you see is here's O2 consumption, and here is the distance that you can walk in six minutes. Okay. And you will note this relatively linear, it begins to sort of turn up here at the very top. Okay, but especially if these low levels, it's relatively linear relationship between distance walk and peak VO2. So this is a submaximal test. This is what we're going to do for lab two. All right. I'm going to have you guys put an app on your phone, or you can just use Google Maps if you want. But you guys are going to set a timer, and you're going to go walk, hopefully in a straight line on some nice flat ground. I mean, it is Norman. It's pretty flat everywhere. But you're going to go walk for six minutes and you're going to walk as fast as you can. Whatever you think is the fastest that you can go. Okay. Walk, cover as much ground as you can in six minutes. And then based upon that distance, you're going to plug that distance, your age, your sex, I think your resting heart rate into an equation. And we will use that to guesstimate what we think your peak VO2 is. Okay. And I can tell you guys that of the things, if it's done correctly, this is just as, if not more accurate than a lot of the other, uh, the other estimation tests. And the cool thing about this one is that it's really, really useful. This is why I've switched to doing it initially, because you could do it from home all by yourself because of COVID. But it's also really good because it's really helpful and useful in clinical populations. You're a PT, you're an OT, you're a PA, or you're going to be some kind of a personal trainer or something. You can do this and you just tell the person, just walk as fast as you can for six minutes. We do it in the building with people with MS and stuff. They walk up and down the hallway over down here in front of our, in front of our offices. We have it like, it, like it's not now. They took it out to someone, they put it in the carpets, but it was just taped off. And they just walk. You follow them with like a little wheel that measures how far they've gone. But you just follow them. You can walk behind them. So if they get busy, you can grab them, right? You don't need any other fancy equipment because our phones do all of this now. 
just out go, and we can get a very reasonable estimation based upon this kind of stuff. Okay? This is what you guys are going to do. That's going to be our sub maximum. It's just going to walk in there. All right, so sorry. This, and I should have shown this probably before we did the other one, but the reason that submaximal tests work is this very linear relationship between oxygen consumption and heart rate. Okay. So if we imagine that we're down here at some sort of resting oxygen consumption, resting heart rate value where you guys are right now, if you start walking jogging, jogging fast, go all the way out to maximum, then heart rate is going to increase in a very linear manner in relation to this. So if we know where your heart rate is, and we know what the work rate is, we can kind of use this to construct an estimate of, of what your VO2 max value is going to be. That's the idea behind these submaximal tests. Okay, They're easier to do. You don't have to push someone all the way to max. Okay, They can't lie with their heart rate. If you're doing a true max test, you can say like, oh, I just quit. I didn't want to go. I don't want to run that mile as fast as I could. Or I was going as hard as I could, but you're like, your heart rate tells us that you're not going as, as kind of hard as you can. This is the good part about, about all of those things. Okay. So in the absence of those things, you can do what's called a field test. So you can walk a mile. Similar idea behind the six minute walk test. Okay. Problem is, if you're going to walk, anybody ever try to walk a mile as fast as you can? No. Walk a mile in my shoes, uphill both ways in the snow. No. Okay. So, one mile walk test, relatively similar to the six minute walk test, is probably going to last 13, 14, 16, 18 minutes, depending upon how long it takes a person to walk. Okay. But it's the same thing. You use age, weight, and sex to be able to do your, your mile time to estimate the VO2. So it can work. And then there are these running and jogging tests um, that we're going to be able to do. And so there's a one and a half mile run test, which is kind of the same thing, where you can run for 12 minutes and you see how much distance you've covered in 12 minutes. And so the idea is that you ask the person to kind of go as hard as they can for some set distance or set time. And you can use that then to, to try to estimate your VO2 max. Several of you guys put, we're just going to run a mile. We're going to see who's the fastest. And that will tell us sort of who's the most fit. That's a very reasonable thing to do. Okay. In a vacuum, your ability to go quickly and cover a mile the fastest, either walking or jogging, should relate to your VO2 max. Unless we've got people that are pretty close in their VO2 max and then some other things. I have this nice slide on the kind of advantages and disadvantages of field tests and lab tests. Okay. The real thing is that field tests are easy and they're cheap. The bad part of them is that they're less accurate. Okay. The good part of a lab test is it's accurate, but it's hard and it's expensive. That's kind of the general take home from, from, from summarizing all of these things. Okay. If you are in a position where you have a lab test available to you, then by all means do the lab test. In the absence of all of that, though, you can, you can pick out the field test that's going to most closely mimic whatever it is that you're wanting that you're wanting to do. Okay. I would love nothing more than for the track team to come and let us test the VO2 max of all of their athletes several times a year in the lab. They have not expressed a similar amount of uh, excitement about all of that. They've never once asked us about any of those things, which I find to be a little baffling, but they haven't. Um, and I would tell them that they should try to do some sort of a field test anyway, try to guesstimate at those things, um, and kind of figure out if whatever it is that they're doing is working. So, all right. Got about 25 minutes. So let's take our second question from today that I asked you guys to go through. And let's talk about that. Okay. So we'll start in the back. Devin, what did you and Ramsey come up with on what you should do? So 
We've done your test. We know what your VO2 max is now. Now we need to switch over into, I want to train to try to make this better. What would you guys tell us that we should go and do? Okay, five days, at least 30 minutes, okay? And uh, at least two days of strength training. Two days of strength training, okay. Should I just go walk for 30 minutes on those five days? Would that be a reasonable thing for me to do? I think you could pick that. I think okay. you could run, jog, you could do like a stair run for okay. that kind of thing. Okay. Is there, what do the rest of you guys think? Ken or Ella, what'd y'all come up with? We think that's enough, I guess. If it's a novel stimulus, okay, what would be novel? How would we know if it was novel? Like if there's a walking, mm -hmm. then there's jogging. If it's jogging, I don't do a little running. Okay. But they're just sedentary all day. Mm -hmm. walk. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Very, very good. It was close. Can I rather what y'all put? Um, I said that I mean, we were able to just train the time that we had that last part of the week, and then gradually work with the intensity. Okay, well, what, what's high intensity? What would I need to do to make it high intensity? If we were going to go over to the huff right now, how would we know if it was high intensity? Okay, I'm talking about heart rate. Okay, something close. Mets. Mets. Over six. Met over six. Okay, what if I'm really, really fit though, and my maximal met output is like, you know, like 18 or 19 or 20? Then you think just doing like seven is really gonna, gonna be that taxing for me? I'm sorry, like, I didn't, No, like you would do like high intensity until you fatigue. High intensity until I fatigue. Could I do low intensity until I fatigue too? Is the I mean I will I will agree that the fatigue could be important, right? MF TV, what'd you guys have? Okay. We're all really big on this weight training, which I think is great, but I was going to really freak out when I tell you that the weight training actually kind of acts some of the aerobic training a little bit in, in those ways. Okay, so like three days a week, okay, some higher intensity stuff. That's good. Um, what about one of my, one of the Zoom groups? Um, Madison, why don't you tell us what your group came up with? I kind of thought we were supposed to um, talk about like the steps and not necessarily like the exercises. Oh, okay. So, so can you be, what did you guys actually put? That's okay. So y'all were just like, go do something or? Um, well, we're basically, we just said like, um, the exercises would depend on like the goals mm. of what okay. our client needs, of like what type of endurance our client wants to improve on. Okay. Okay. And so like, those, the exercises could include like you could, um, like cycling could be a part of that. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Y'all are y'all are y'all got part of it. Okay. So in the interest of time. So my other two groups on Zoom, y'all type in like what you what you did in in the chat. Like I know Cameron, but y'all already had some chat. So Cameron, your group had four days out of the week, right? Trying to improve your mile time. Two days doing five sets of 100 meter sprints. Oh. 
No. Six days per week. So they're all doing a bunch. Okay. So Cameron, we are talking about trying to improve my mile time. Just run a mile and see if I can go faster every day. Is that the is that what y'all y'all were thinking? Someone from Cameron's group doesn't have to be Cameron. Yes, improve on stamina. Okay. All right. Well, some other group, if y'all put that in chat too, we'll talk about y'all in a minute. So, just like what we did with resistance training, just like with resistance training, the same general principles apply with. Cardio respiratory training or endurance training. Okay. Yes, the things that are going to affect how much better you're going to get and what you do are going to be somewhat dependent upon genetics and somewhat dependent upon your aerobic fitness levels. But we need to understand what is the intensity of training, what's the duration, what's the frequency, and what's kind of what's the most. So we're going to apply the fit principle to this. Right? Frequency and the number of days per week. Type, is it running? Is it walking? Is it cycling? Okay. Time, is it 10 minutes? Is it 15 minutes? Is it two hours? Whatever that is. But just like with resistance training, arguably the thing that we don't do correctly often enough, and it is the most important, is training intensity. Okay. That's why I was trying to press. Ramsey and Devin on what they were going to do. Would walking be enough? Would jogging be enough? And it's really going to be kind of dependent upon what your duration and your frequency is a little bit. Those are going to kind of flow out of the intensity side of things. Okay. So what should we do? Okay. So that's the fit side of things. We'll get into the individual pieces in a minute. We also have to apply progression, repetition, overload, and specificity, just like what we did with resistance. Okay? We need, in order to get you to adapt, and this is just what, what Dylan was getting at, is we have to overload. Okay? You need to do more and make your cardiorespiratory system and your mitochondria do more than whatever it is that they are accustomed to. And so we can achieve that overload through some combination of all of our components, right? You can raise the intensity. You can raise the percentage of VO2 max or the percentage of heart rate max at which you're doing something, okay? If you're used to walking, jog. If you're used to jogging, jog briskly, et cetera, et cetera. You can overload with duration. If you're used to doing 20 minutes, do 30. If you're used to doing 30, do 35. Or the number of times per week. If you're used to doing two days, do a third. So we can increase any of these things, and that will give us our overload. And it's that overload that's going to be the thing that drives our adaptation. And then also, just like with resistance training, we want to be progressive such that when whatever you've been doing becomes easy, then change it up and you do four. Been doing three days and that gets where it feels pretty easy, then do a fourth. And that fourth one gets easy, then go for a little bit longer every time during your four. Okay. And then specificity, and this one is in some ways even more important with aerobic training than it is with resistance. This is where we need to know what a person needs to do. Okay. It's going to seem counterintuitive to you guys, but if you run or walk, you're going to get better at running and walking. You're not going to get better at biking. If you bike, you're probably not going to get that much better at running or walking. I I say that, but I want to put one caveat on it. I want to put one caveat on it. If you have a person that's very unfit, okay, let's say a person whose VO2 max is under 30. Okay? If you're very unfit, then you can bike 
and that will make your running VO2 max go up. And you can run and it will make your biking VO2 max go up, right? But once you get to kind of normal average values on things, you're really going to start to get better doing the modality that you're doing, all right? So if you need to try to train a certain muscle group and in a certain mode of exercise, then that's what you want. I would argue that for the most part, if you can run and walk, you should run and walk unless you have some kind of orthopedic pathology to do those kinds of things. And then the bike is fine. Okay. How much do we need? And this is where you guys pulled most of those things. We're just right back to the ACSM guideline. Okay. For health benefits, 30 minutes of moderate, five days per week, so 150 minutes or 75 minutes, right, of vigorous. We'll talk about how we define those things relative to heart rate in, in the coming slides. And then we'd like to have our couple of days of strength training. We really want to, we want to increase VO2 max. It's this top portion that we need to do this, okay? For true fitness benefits. So health benefits, this is be more active. This is gonna be good for mortality but it doesn't necessarily raise your VO2 max. To increase your VO2 max and get fitness benefits, which are even better for mortality, we need to do three to five days per week, 20 to 60 minutes per session, somewhere between 40 to 85% of what ACSM defines as VO2 reserve, which is a weird ass thing we're not ever gonna talk about again, or heart rate percent. So you need to be somewhere between 40 and 85% of your maximal capacity to do those kinds of things, okay? And if you do that, then that's gonna equate in most people to a certain amount of kilocalories or energy expended in a week. Um, and we know that those, some of those things are also going to increase. So you need to get to that much expenditure and you can get there by manipulating the days or the session length or your intensity in some ways. You guys with me on all of that? All right, so in class on Wednesday, I'm going to give you guys, everyone's going to get the same program, or the same two programs, and you guys are going to evaluate them on these kinds of things and tell me what are they doing well, what are they not doing well, what would we change, okay? So we're going to practice what we will do on the critique and what will happen on the test. Okay, so we'll finish up with this. From a physiological perspective, okay, from a physiological perspective, if my goal is to increase VO2 max and therefore make my cardiorespiratory endurance go up, the biggest influence on that comes from exercise intensity, okay? The thing, right? You probably need, unless you're very, very unfit, to be over 50% of your maximal VO2 during a bout of exercise in order to drive an adaptation that will lead to an increase in your VO2. Okay? For most of you, 50% is not even going to cut it. Okay? You probably need to be at 60% or above. For those of you that are very well trained, it probably may even need to be 80% or above. But this is the most important thing. So that means run faster. Okay, run up a hill. On the elliptical, for God's sakes, turn the resistance up so you're not sitting there talking on the phone. Okay, I see that less now because nobody talks to me used to, like 15 years ago, when I was a grad student, go and you'd see people talking on their cell phones, like on the elliptical, I'm like you're clearly not working hard enough if you're talking on the cell phone. So I apologize. Okay. This is the most important one. Right? This is the most important one. Duration and frequency are important, but they're less so. Okay. From a duration standpoint, purely to increase VO2 max, if Intensity is constant if you increase your duration up to about 40 minutes of exercise. 
beyond 40 minutes and the effect plateau. So 40 will get you better bang for your buck than 30. 30 gets you more than 20. 60 is no better than 40. Okay? 60 is no better than 40. Madison, y'all ever run longer than 40 minutes? And your race lasts how long? 6K? So I mean, it lasts like 20 minutes? Yeah. Hmm. Maybe we should think about these things. And I'm back, all right? Anything after 40 and it plateaus. Please do not interpret this as me saying that running or biking longer than 40 minutes is pointless. It is not. I assure you, if you're going to do a race that lasts an hour or an hour and a half or something like that, you really need to try to go that distance and time. But anything over 40 and VO2 max is a good goal. Okay. Similarly, from a frequency standpoint, anything over five days per week, and that's fine, but you're not going to increase VO2 max if the duration and the intensity are similar. A sixth and a seventh day doesn't really help you from a VO2 max standpoint that much. This highlights rest is important. We need to rest. Okay, We need to rest. So, but of all of these things, I think intensity is intensity is the most important thing. Okay. Because intensity is the thing that drives the increase in heart rate, it drives the increase in stroke volume, it drives the increase in blood pressure, it drives the use of oxygen in our muscles, which taxes the mitochondria. Intensity is the piece that overloads and throws our system out of homeostasis. That's the thing. Okay. The problem is intensity sucks, right? That's the hard part. It's hard. No one wants to do that, okay? No one wants to do that. So, I don't want to talk me there. Next slide is, yeah, we talked about those things. We talked about duration. So, uh, this is pretty self-explanatory, okay? So, if you have different goals, this is just a graphic that's trying to get at what the ACSM recommendations are, right? For health benefits, this is your 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity, right? Fitness, this is your, the intensity is higher. It may be 150 minutes, but it's at a higher heart rate, basically. That's going to get us an increase in VO2. And then performance, here's our kind of endurance athletes where they got to train at probably greater than 80% of VO2 max. This thing suggests training set every day of the week, plus maybe multiple training sessions in a day. You can't do that for a super duper long, you'll, you'll basically kill yourself. Okay. Okay. Yep, so let's stop and we'll pick up with the other piece of the prescription talking about how we use heart rate on Wednesday. For your in-class thing, please make sure your name is on it and your group member or member's name are on it and turn that into me. My Zoom folks, email it to me, okay? Email it to me with all your group members. All right, good deal. You guys have a good couple of days. We'll see you on Wednesday. You need a back for that engineering? No, I uh, no worries. You may. Let me do this.